speaker today, uh, Dr. Asoli. Dr. Asoli is a Benjamin Pierce Fellow of Mathematics at Harvard University. And uh, if you don't know what a fellow is, it's a very prestigious position at Harvard. They pay you big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> And they let you completely do whatever you want to do. <clears throat> the only requirement <clears throat> is you have to stay in Cambridge for the three years you're funded. <laughs> That's pretty good, huh? So uh, uh, you can do whatever research you want to in whatever area you want to. And uh, yeah, there's quite some illustrious names if you look at the fellows of Harvard. Uh, anybody a uh, behavioralist, a psychologist, behavioralist who comes to mind? Here, here, Skinner. He was a fellow at Harvard. Uh, um, let's see, uh, some others are, oh, every engineer should know this one, Fardine. Two Nobel Prizes in physics, one for the transistor, and one for superconductivity. Okay, and, uh, uh, well, what about the biologist? Anybody know E.O. Wilson? Very famous biologist. Uh, it's also a fellow at Harvard. And uh, uh, Ed Whitney. The elegant universe I tell you to watch? You <laughs> <laughs> didn't, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think you told me you were you're in this office, or the same office, or uh, Brian Benjamin. Oh, Brian Benjamin was working with Professor Young. And uh, he's uh, well, in in uh, in the elegant universe. He's a salesman for string theory, or promoting himself. Uh, I just found out that he actually took uh, acting lessons or something, or uh, built into uh, uh, that before he did the movie and so forth. So, uh, the elegant universe. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Scully is also uh, a member of the Center for Fundamental Laws of Nature, which is theoretical physics. <laughs> so this is a theoretical physics group, uh, and uh, his work then uh, is in mathematics and, and theoretical physics. Uh, his main area of research, I guess, is geometry and uh, string theory and like that. And uh, he, uh, a little bit of his background, he. Uh, jumped all over the place. He went to an undergraduate in Brussels and then uh, did his uh, BS in Cambridge in mathematics also and uh, and then PhD in Leiden. What's famous called Leiden? Helium. Helium was first liquefied in for superconductivity. Come on. All right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, very famous people. They're actually the rents of <coughs> and uh, earned best and uh, uh, a lot of history there. Uh, so he does PhD from Leiden. Uh, he's done a postdoc at the European Union, I think he said. I'm not going to be. And uh, and at Harvard here. So uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Scully and the entertainment. <laughs> So I'm very happy to, uh, to be here. It's actually my first time uh, to come like, uh, uh, to the campus here in this part of the city. Now I'm asking myself why is it we don't inter interact more often. We are like all in the same city. Uh, but <laughs> we're going to work on this. Uh, so the subject of my talk are uh, 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 elliptic curves uh, and the role of physics. So I'm going to go on. Uh, and with you the, the history of uh, the subject. Um, so my father is a professor, was a professor of uh, philosophy and anthropology. Um, so my first experience with science was more related to the philosophy and the history of uh, the science inside my father's books. So this subject in particular is beautiful by the fact that it connects uh, different civilizations through history. And so that's something that uh, I'd like uh, uh, to share, especially with the, the students here, to see that 
once we do research today, uh, we actually build it up on something that people did before us. People who spoke all kinds of languages and from all kinds of culture. So the first question uh, we can ask is, uh, what is an elliptic curve? So this is a question uh, for which different people will give you different answer depending on the background. So I'm going to be like playing different role for two minutes. So suppose uh, I am a topologist. Then I will tell you that an elliptic curve is just a topologist. So a torus looks like a donut, and uh, you can think of it as a circle that moves uh, as you move, it is fine like a, like a surface, and that surface is called the torus. So now, um, in an algebraic geometer, we think of an elliptic curve uh, as a genus one curve. So the curve. And the genus of a uh, curve here, I have to give an explanation. Uh, in algebraic geometry, they work over the complex numbers. So what they call a curve, you have to multiply by two to, to get the real dimension, is actually a surface. It's a human surface. And the genus of that surface is just the number of times you can count uh, the surface without pulling it into so a curve of genus 1 is exactly like this. I can do one cut, and it still stays together. But if I do two cuts, I basically end up with two different objects. So now, um, if you are uh, in number theory, you will actually object to this definition, because you will say genus 1 is not enough to describe an elliptic curve, because you also need to make a choice of a point. So I would say a minute curve would be a, a curve of genus one with a choice of a rational point. And so this part rational point is actually very important. So let me explain this. So suppose I write an equation, an algebraic equation, over uh, the integers. That equation can have solutions. Some of the solutions can also be integral numbers. And other solutions can be real numbers. So what I would call a rational solution is a solution that is actually uh, integral. And we don't distinguish because this equation, when they are homogeneous, you can always get rid of the denominator. So it's not clear that when you write an equation, it always admit a rational point, even if it admits an infinite number of real points. So when you have rational point, it's you are in a very special situation. Then uh, the existence of a rational point uh, can be used to show the existence of many other rational points. I'm going to give uh, an example from 101 math, like uh, just a question of one to two. Suppose I write uh, an equation of degree 2, and I tell you that one of the solutions is a rational solution, and I assume here that uh, E and B are they're also rational, so well, let's say I work over the rational. Then you can just say that uh, because uh, I can factorize this equation, if I have one rational solution, the other solution has to be rational. Because when I multiply, I end up with a rational number. That means that the existence of one rational number will imply the existence of others. So, so now there is uh, a, a, a fourth definition of uh, an elliptic curve, which uh, will naturally produce the genus one condition. So I can say that uh, an elliptic curve is uh, an algebraic curve of the degree three in the project. 
So there is a way to compute the genius of the curve if you want the degree of the equation that characterizes the permanent path of the If you take a cubic curve, you always have a curve which has genius one. Now, the link with this story I told you is the following. So, this is an example of a cubic curve. I'm writing the cubic curve over the wheel. But because it has degree three, if I take a intersection with a line, I automatically get three points of intersection. So it means that every time I get two points, I get a third point. And if the two points I start with a rational point, the third point will also be a rational point. And starting with uh, rules like this, I can actually construct an algorithm that from which I can build like a group on a given curve. So now, what if you only have one rational point on the curve? Then you can do the following. Let's have a construct to build my rational point here. I'm going to write uh, a line which is essentially tangent to that curve. So then I think of this point of intersection as a point of intersection of multiplicity 2. So the second point of intersection uh, can be used to still say that even that curve intersects the cubic curve in three points. So it means even if I start with one rational point, I can generate many others by just intersecting with lines. So these type of techniques are related to what is now known as a uh, uh, demand-domain group of the curve. And that's actually the secret for the curve. They are geometric objects that also have a very interesting mathematical, let's say, arithmetic structure. They have a group structure in them. So they are curved but they have a group structure. So now I told you that this is a subject that is extremely old. And so let's see how old it is. Uh, so the first civilization that started doing some basic mathematics can be traced to uh, like um, the Egyptian, the Babylonian. And so if you go and read the tablet, you see that they're actually pretty good with cubic equation. Uh, in particular, uh, you have that city called Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, so it's the name also of uh, the library. And the history of that library is interesting by itself. So this was uh, a city built uh, by a general of uh, Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great went to conquer like, uh, uh, so all this empire. And when he died, his general decided to speak because it was too big for you know, just one ruler. And uh, the Ptolemy, which was maybe the most famous of his general, he took Egypt, which was the nicest piece of uh, the empire, and one thing that this family did is they, they built a library. So back in the days, uh, the library of Alexandria, you can think of it as a, an example of a university today. So they had scholars that uh, were scholars for the sake of being scholars. They were not studying math necessary for its application. So if you compare to the, the traditional way in which mathematics was done in Egypt, there, there were a need to compute volume and areas, mostly to, because people had to pay taxes. So if I want to know how much I should charge you, and you do, you have like a field, and you are like growing some vegetables, so I need to compute the area, and your text will be proportional to that. So if you put the, everything you have in, in some like house, if I can compute the volume of that house, I know how much you're making I can charge your taxes on based on that. But in the library, there were people who were studying geometry for the sake of the beauty of uh, the subject. So uh, one of the most beautiful pieces of mathematics we have, so the clean element of geometry were actually written there. And the study of elliptic curve was also done systematically. And then uh, that knowledge was passed to uh, the Arabs because the, the books were translated in Arabs, part of them were lost and they were discovered later on. So when you think of subjects like Fermat last year, 
which is also a subject related to normal theory. It's closely related to the study of uh, elliptic curves. And the solution to, to that conjecture came by studying the property of the normal vehicle. So you can trace this very far in our mathematics. So interestingly enough, our elliptic curves are also useful in physics. So I'm going to talk about them in the context of string theory, but to see elliptic curves, you don't need to do string theory. The study of a simple pendulum will give you information on the elliptic curve. Um, but I'm not going to get into this, and I'm going to move on straight to the rest of the talk. So, so far, uh, I, I described an elliptic curve as a, as a torus, uh, but for the sake of this talk, it's interesting to see what happens when the elliptic curve is moving over another space. So you have a vibration, so let's go and study the simplest case. Let's say I have like some curve, and I put a torus on that curve, and the torus is moving over the curve. And as it does, it describes uh, a space which is of higher dimension in the torus itself, so we have one extra dimension. So, so now, um, why people do uh, construction like this? So in mathematics, the main goal uh, of uh, making an object move over another is to try to understand what is the space of possibility for the fabric. So in other words, we would like to think also of a singular torus. What are the possible shapes that the torus can get when it becomes singular? Um, this question, in the case of the elliptic curve, was not really addressed uh, for a while. So there are uh, different mathematicians in the 17, uh, 18, 19th century that study different families of elliptic curve, and by family they mean elliptic curve parameterized by a line like this. So let's say I call, for example, this line T. And I'm going to give you an example of the famous family of uh, elliptic curves. So I'm going to write a cubic equation. Um, that will depend on the parameter T. So this is an example of the cubic equation. Um, I'm writing it in a Lafayette uh, plane. So the x and y are the coordinates of my Lafayette plane, and I think of t as a parameter. So if I project it like this, or we have a regular cubic in P2, so that would have that would be a curve of genus one. But then there are some value uh, of the parameter t for which this curve becomes singular. So for example. If you see what happens at t equals 0, you see that the equation takes the following form. t equals 0 means that this factor becomes the same as the first one. Yes. Yeah, so x squared. Right? Uh, so I get x squared from x here. Oh, uh, yeah, x here. Yeah, sorry. Um, if I go to t equals 1, these two become the So these two equations are not elliptic curve anymore because they have a singularity. So you call them not a curve. And one way to think of a nodal curve, which is actually uh, precise, is as a degeneration of a tori, of a torus. So think of a torus described with a circle here, you have another circle that goes along, and then you take the limit in which you are shrinking that circle to a point. So in that limit, you have a degeneration. Well, you have a singularity like this, and you can think of this as a sphere in which you identify the north and the south. So such an object is called Novel similarity. And a nodal curve is just an elliptic curve 
that produce a model singularity. So this equation, the singularity can be seen by the fact that you have y squared proportional to x squared. So locally, if you factorize this equation, you think of x minus 1 as a development term, it can split into two lines that intersect each other. So that's also like a description of the normal curve. So the local description of the similarity is like this. And uh, usually in math, you can close it. So people usually uh, like uh, the normal curve like this. So every time you see the infinity symbol, just remember that this is the normal curve similarity. So this is an example of a degeneration. And the degeneration can be even worse than this. So I'm going to draw another equation here. So this equation is very different from this other one. Uh, for every value of t different from 0, I have like a small uh, genius one here. But when t becomes equal to 0, what I have is called the cusp. So the singularity of the cusp are much worse than the similarity of the normal curve because near the similarity of the normal curve, you have two tangents uh, that are still different from each other. Whereas the cusp is more like this. It's a singularity in which the two tangents coincide. And our normal curve and the cusp are the typical singularity of the so I'm going to now uh, describe like, uh, a model that we have both of these similarities at the same time. And so this is like a classical theory of mathematics that produce what is called the Ryan Strauss equation, which is the typical equation of a genius one curve with a rational form, so you can always put it in the polynomial form. And then um, the condition uh, from this degeneration are the following. So if the cubic equation that I wrote on the, the right hand side can factorize into terms so that two of uh, the factor coincide, and we have a double point singularity, which is a plus. And there is an algebraic condition for this to happen, which is a simple equation. So if I choose a curve with coefficient f and g such that this coefficient satisfies this equation, the typical situation is that I have a number then there is a situation which is much more special that when f and g are both zero, when f and g are both zero, we end up with a like a cusp. So, so now um, I'm supposed to think that this is still a special case of t equals zero here. Yes, t equals zero here yeah. is about a wire stress equation where f is always zero and t is and g is both. So these are the typical degeneration of uh, an elliptic curve using like, the wire stress model. So, so now I'm going to make a connection with physics. So first of all, I need to know the other. So who is a physicist here? Who, who is a mathematician? OK. So, okay, so now I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to explain how this connect to physics, and, and it's going to be very natural. So the degeneration I, I represented here depending on one parameter. And there are actually worse things that can happen than model and cause similarity. And this, uh, when you have things that are worse than that, you naturally reproduce something that every physicist will recognize. So you know that in physics, interaction are described uh, using gauge theories. And this gauge theory are based on gauge group. And this gauge group uh, uh, have B algebra, and this B algebra classified using thinking diagrams. So I'm going to explain how, uh, from the degeneration of uh, an elliptic curve, you can naturally reproduce 
the classification of a uh, uh, thinking diagram. Um, this would be the hint that uh, this subject is related to the age groups. And then we will go deeper in uh, this understanding. Is, it, is there any significance to the fact that it has to have a singularity to the... Uh... Um, yes, but that's, that's when we're going to get into the string theory story. Because string theory has this uh, beautiful uh, property that it doesn't, it's not afraid of singularities. So going through singularities like, is something very natural. And usually when you, you get excited when there's singularity because that's when something special happens. For example, generation of the so, okay, so here we want to talk about thinking diagrams and the measure classification. So Kodaipa is a, a very famous mathematician, he's an algebraic geometrician. <coughs> Uh, who uh, did his work uh, in the 1940s. So this particular work is from the, 90, the early 1960s, and he's Japanese. Uh, so you have to think of the time. So the, this was after the Second World War, and Kodeha was a mathematician, and he did this work while he was a fellow at Harvard. So he, he had uh, the same position as I have now. So what he did was to answer the following question. So if you try to study in algebraic geometry the classification of surfaces, they are classified by some topological criteria, and it happens that the surfaces that have a vibration structure uh, have to be studied separately because they are like a special case. So you can have a vibration where the fiber is just like a, a sphere, a P1 curve, a rational curve, and you have this vibration, uh, this would be vibration of linear zero curve. And then you have this vibration of genus one curve, which are vibration of elliptic curves. So then, um, if you have an elliptic curve that moves over another curve, as we discussed before, the elliptic curve can become singular. And you can ask the question, what are all the possible singularity you can get? So there are two that we have already studied. Uh, so we have seen that you can have like a normal curve, You can have a cosmic curve. But then they also have a vision ratio. The first one that is the most natural to understand. Uh, so let me put some name, uh, like Kodeha has his own notation for this, so he called the normal curve with singularity of f i1 and the cosmic curve for singularity of f2. And he has what we call singularity of type Similarity of type IN can be obtained in the following way. So if you take um, if you take a torus and you make a selection of n circles and then you shrink them to point at the same time, what you will get it looks like this, like a chapelet. Yeah, I went to a Catholic school, so this shape I think of it as a shot of it was a bit. Um, so these are the points that represent the circle of that shape. So now, I'm writing on my situation relation this way. So, so now, I'm going to write this differently. So I'm going to represent every one of these objects as a circle, with an asphere. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. And then when they are connected, I draw them. So those of you who are interested in representation theory, you immediately recognize that this is an extended thinking diagram. So it's like an affine thinking diagram. So singularity of that and are exactly of that type. They are just like connection of spheres that intersect transversely. And from the point of view of the D algebra, um, 
it's actually expanding n minus one. Um, if you remove one node, you retreat the typical shape of uh, the, the thinking diagram of uh, a group like SUR. Then, Cosena uh, has a group type which are called I star n. And I star n similarity has the following shape. And again, you see immediately that this is typical of uh, the algebra of type T. Then it has a sequence of special cases. So you see that these two come in families. Like the, there is a sequence of them. You can go from range from 1 to infinity. But then you have others that are exceptional. Um, the exceptional ones are called uh, type 4 star. Star, two star. I'm going to draw the one of that four star. And these guys actually have multiplicity, so if you're writing this figure like this, and again, so you will recognize that this is an expanding E6 thinking that. Then our uh, type three star is the extended E7. And then you have an expanded field. So, as you can see, uh, you would expect to also have there is a star here, so there is a reason because you also have fiber of type 4 and of type 3. The fiber of type 2 is already here, so clearly the, 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 we would think that there is a relation between them. So, a fiber of type 3 is uh, just two curves that intersect at the level. Whereas the type 4 are just like three curves that intersect at one point. So, in other words, by just studying how um, the empty curve degenerate, you reproduce a structure that is very similar to the structure you see uh, when you study the algebra. So, now we will see that this is actually not the maximum yet. Look the multiple series with the uh, coefficients of the highest. Um, from from the geometric point of view, uh, not really. So the, the way this multiplicity comes is that you really think of it as like curves on top of other curves. Okay. And then uh, you can, like if you extend them, you can now see that they, they have some natural uh, like uh, interpretation also in terms of the weight of representation. So for the same reason here, those get a line in the middle will have multiplicity too. And uh, those have multiplicity. So, so, so now I want to make this point uh, that the fact that you end up seeing this structure is actually not uh, an accident if you're a string theorist. You actually expect to see that. So let me uh, raise the woman get into the string theory part of the talk. So what is string theory? So string theory is a, is a theory of uh, an extended object, which is like the string that moves freely in a space. So, so now, in contrast to other parts of physics, you don't assume much about that object. And you immediately start studying the quantification of uh, that string. And then what you see is that there are some strong restrictions on what is the space in which the string can live. So if you try to quantify like a point particle, uh, you basically have to decide what is the dimension of the space in which it lives. So if you look around here, you might choose 3 plus 1. But in string theory, this is the, the dimension of the space is actually not like a, a free parameter. It is restricted by uh, the condition of the theory to be free of element. So you have 
different uh, version of string theory. The one uh, that we are interested in today is the one that needs in 10 dimension. And in 10 dimension, depending on these three choices, uh, you can have different string theory. The one we are interested in is called the original, which is defined by uh, the chirality of some factors. So now, type 2 b string theory has a lot of different fields, but one particular field that it has is called the axial Lacan field. I'm going to call this now, and we can think of it as a complex field which contains like two rules. So, so the Lagrangian of type 2 e is invariant on a certain type of transformation. And this type of transformation acts like this on tau. So it takes tau and sends it to B tau plus D, C tau plus D. When A, B, C, D have an element of SL to Z. So the Lagrangian itself requires only SL to R. But if you consider the fact that you have objects that are charged, uh, the real group break into a line to the group. So this is typical. So, so now, another important property you see that the imaginary part is proportional to an exponential. You have that the imaginary part of tau is actually a positive number. So these two things together, if you show it to uh, a number of theorists, they start screaming elliptic curve all over the room. Why? Because, uh, let's take uh, the class of topology one How do you describe a torus? You can describe a torus by starting with a lattice. And then identify the parallel side of the lattice. So if I glue these two guys together, I get a cylinder. And then if I glue the boundary of the cylinder, I get a torus. So now, let's say that I want to analyze my unit so that the length of uh, this side is one, and then the structure of the torus is really defined by this point. So you can think of it really like an imaginary part. And let's say I call this complex number tau. So now tau, I can always require tau to be, uh, to have a positive imaginary part, because if it has a negative imaginary part, I just flip it very symmetrically. And I bring it back to the positive side. So, so now, what is the moduli space of such tori? Like, how do I see when two tori are the same? I could take this point, for example. So let's say this is my original tori. And I could say, OK, I'm actually interested in one that is just shifted a little bit. It happens that these two tori will be exactly the same. So I have a degree of freedom. Think of it as a gauge symmetry. That's kind of the idea. That you do a transformation, and the transformation doesn't matter. It leaves the object the same. That transformation is exactly this one. So in other words, you can think of the action dilaton field that you see in type 2 this string theory as describing the shape of a torus. So, so now uh, comes like a, a very simple question. Suppose I want to solve the equation of type 2 this string theory. I have to solve uh, in particular for tau. And now I have a geometric way to specify the solution. I can just give you an elliptic vibration. Vibration over the space seen by the theory. And the fiber by itself, is not, it's not physical, but Tau, which represents the complex structure of the fiber, is the physical field. And then the degree of freedom, uh, where basically this transformation should not change the physics, are just the natural modular transformation of the torus. So from that point of view, um, there is like a natural symmetry, let's say a natural duality between type 2 B on a description of a multi-fabrication. So let's go a little bit deeper in this geometric construction 
Uh, so, so this is an example of what uh, in string theory we call geometric engineering. You have a physical problem. If you step at it long enough with your geometric glasses, you see that it has a, a natural geometric interpretation. So before, we have seen that uh, uh, when you consider an elliptic vibration, you naturally produce this thinking diagram. So now the question would be, what is the physics of this thinking diagram in type 2? The answer is very simple. The axial dilaton field is actually magnetic dual of another field. So it sees the presence of what are called disintegrates. Well, let's just call them separate. In the same way as if you have a magnet, uh, a magnet can detect the presence of an electric field, and vice versa. For the same reason, the axon dilaton field and the cell can detect the presence of certain brains. And the certain brains are used in type 2B to produce gauge field. So now, the, the fact that we have certain brain and gauge field in type 2B, and the fact that you have this called AHA, Fibers on the elliptic vibration give a natural dictionary between the geometry and the physics. So, in other words, when I see a seven grade, let's say with a gauge group SU3, I expect to see an elliptic vibration with a certain type of thinking diagram. So, now in physics, the gauge group are not the whole story. You also need to have matter that transforms under the gauge group. Like in the standard model, you have the gauge group as you press you to U1, but you also have matter fermions that transform in specific representation of the gauge group. So let's see uh, how this picture can be understood from the point of view of the gauge group. So we have already seen that if you take like a torus, the torus might degenerate into some Dinkin diagram. And this happens in co-dimensional one. So there is a discriminant locus over which this happens, which means a hypersurface over which such degeneration is. But then the fiber you get in this degeneration can degenerate further in higher co-dimension. So for example, you can move and you see that this node will all of a sudden split into two other nodes. And you end up with a fiber that is much more similar than the one you had in the beginning. So now you might ask me, what does it have to do with representation? The idea is very simple. If you think of enhancement of gauge group uh, in physics, you naturally have like an open door to representation. So let's see an example. Let's assume that this is an SUM matrix that I'm going to split into two other groups. So I can have SUM here and SUM here. Then the question is, what happens to the blocks that sit between them? The blocks that sit between them will transform in a representation which are by fundamental with respect to SUM and SUM. So now, geometrically, you also see the same picture appearing here. So what happened is the following. So you have to think of the curve that I draw here as defined in co-dimension 1. This one I defined in co-dimension 2. So I can now ask the following question. Let's say I pick up this specific curve. I can ask what are the intersection number of that curve with the hypersurface defined by these nodes as they move over the bits. We end up with like a, a collection of numbers, and it happens that when you do that computation, the numbers that you get are exactly the weight of the given representation. So you can basically, by doing purely a geometric computation, end up with a natural collection of weight that totally characterize 
the representation we have. And using this trick, it's possible to totally geometrically engineer theory that have a certain gauge group and certain representation. So, so how much time I have? You have another two minutes. Okay. We so, can save a little bit of time for questions, maybe, but another ten minutes. Yeah. So 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 now this is when it, it becomes really beautiful. Uh, so so far we have seen we can geometrically we present gauge group with our representation. The representation comes through weights that are coming from intersection numbers. So now how do we put all this uh, together? So far, the mathematics I described are just the mathematics that were known before string theory. Now I'm going to describe like a, a way where asking a physics question after you translate it into geometry gives you a hint into geometry that we didn't know before. So the classification of the co-dimension one similarity were done by Coday in 1962. And there were no classification of higher co-dimension similarity. But as I described, the physics of string theory give a natural hint of what should be uh, the fiber in higher co-dimension. So we found a quote with Harvard, so let me uh, make advertisement for our student. Uh, so, uh, so, Chuhen Chao is uh, a graduate student uh, in the physics department. It happens that he's our best student. We give a prize every year to the best student this year that comes in. Uh, so we have um, Monica Kang, who is also a graduate student in physics uh, in the string theory group. Uh, so these two students, they work with me together with uh, uh, Professor Yao, so S.T. Yao, who is a, a mathematician. Um, and so together, so we have a, a program to basically study uh, the geometry of elliptic vibration using this inspiration from physics. So one type of uh, problem that we have uh, addressed uh, this year, and that was subject of uh, the talk of the String Theory Conference of 2014, um, is essentially the following. So in geometry, when you have singularity, you have to resolve the singularity. So it means you have a single space, and there are different ways you can smooth a single space. So usually, uh, the solution to smooth a single space is not unique. There are a diversity of ways to smooth uh, a single space, and these are related by what are called uh, uniform transition. which are just special type of uh, bilational similarity. So it happens that when you study a purely physical problem of studying the Coulomb branch of this gauge theory, so the Coulomb branch is just the space that, like uh, the modular space that this physical theory can have, you end up with a structure that very much looks like a picture like this, when every region here could be a consistent physics theory. And then, when you have singularity, what you do is that you go from one consistent theory to another. So think of it uh, like uh, in terms of, for example, topological defect, when uh, you can have a, a given magnetic charge for like a, a certain vortex. And in order to change this, you need to do something drastic because continuous deformation will not change the magnetic charge. So the same. Uh, this is a good analogy with what happened here. So you have some physical transition that can send you from one point to another. And in mathematics, this physical transition I exactly understood as the rational trans transition or polyphone transition that people more generally than the swaps. So let's say you're interested in an s theory, theory with a theory with a certain then the physics of what is this space is totally well understood. And we thought that this is actually a prediction for what is the mathematical way to resolve this elliptic vibration that has similarity that is quite And we, we basically did 
like a contradiction on both sides. So this is like a, a physics picture, and this is like the geometric picture. Predicting the structure from the physics, we could show by doing rigorous mathematic resolution of light that you get exactly the same thing. And the type of uh, the type of theorem that you can prove are highly non-trivial. You can predict the structure of these uh, elliptic fibers in higher dimension by just using uh, representation theory. Because as I said, the representation theory gives the grade, so it tells you how the curve intersects uh, the ambient space. So now, because the physics is both related on one side to uh, the vibration, and on the other side, to representation theory. You can also then just ignore the physics, and what you end up with is a relation between representation theory and the structure of elliptic vibration. And by basically going into this state that uh, our mathematician probably don't necessarily understand, we can make very strong claim about consequences of representation theory on the geometry of elliptic vibration. So this comes with a price. So when you have a duality like this, it's only useful if you can simplify some computation that are extremely hard to do on one side. It happens that resolution of singularity are very hard to do. But the study of some representation theory and their weight are relatively easy to do. So in other words, you give me a geometry, I try to interpret it in terms of this is a physical system of a certain gauge group with matter that transforms into certain representation, and I can predict what the geometry will do. The computation that we do on this side in like an hour, on the other side took us something like nine months. So you can imagine the power of uh, this type of result when you basically can predict within like a few minutes a geometry that when you try to prove it using all the rigor uh, that you want, take a crazy amount of time to do. So one of the basic principles uh, that we use here is the idea of anomaly conservation. So in physics, anomaly is a big problem. You want your theory to have no anomaly. And when you ask the theory to have no anomalies, you need to have a very nice balance between representation groups and the type of matter you have. This balance is exactly what helps us to do the prediction. Uh, so I will conclude uh, with this. Uh, string theory does not necessarily represent the real world. However, if uh, you think of it as a dictionary between different types of geometry, because uh, a theory can be self-consistent even if it doesn't exist in our universe. I'm not saying that theory does not exist, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter. If you're interested in the geometry of string theory, you can think of it as a, a novel that gives you hint into aspect of geometry that you were not smart enough to think by yourself. And so this theory naturally tells us that when you do representation theory, you think that you're not doing geometry, but you're actually doing geometry. And the geometry that you are doing predicts the following phenomena. And then you can check and prove them by whatever techniques you want. And there is also the transfer of techniques from one field to another. So just from the point of view of the mathematics, this is a very powerful tool. So if you're interested in the physics, the fact that geometry can also be used to model physics system and just follow the tradition developed by people like Maxwell and Albert Einstein, where basically the history of physics can be seen as a history of more and more geometry in the field. So I'm going to stop here. So we have time for one or two questions.
I said there's a question. Uh, can you can you do? Is it possible to show a more realistic connection for me if uh, you did like uh, quantum electrodynamics or something? Can you? Yes. So like one of the main example uh, that we did, but actually the first one we did, is to model ground unified fields. So this is a very like uh, simple request. So someone come and tell you, okay, uh, we have this theory which is called SU5 from unified theory, which represents uh, a possibility for the standard model to exist in high energy stock. It doesn't really work all the way, but conceptually it's like a nice example. And then uh, they ask, can you reproduce uh, the matter content of this theory using the And then the answer is yes. And, um, this is a nice example. So if you start with SU5, clearly your gate group is SU5, so you start with a deep impact one of this time. So now if I try to model this geometrically, that fiber has a lot of places where it becomes more singular. How does it become more singular? So there is one singularity over which it extends to this diagram and another one in which it extends to this one. So now if you are familiar with uh, uh, like uh, linear algebra, so this is like uh, an extended uh, A4, this is an extended A5, and this is uh, an extended D5. The representation that I'm actually associated to these are exactly the representation used in SU5 theory to model like quarks, you have like a 10, uh, so you have sorry, the 5 of SU5 and the 10 of SU10 are naturally reproduced. Then these two uh, singularities actually hit each other, and when they hit each other, they produce higher singular curve. And here I put it in bracket because it's not an E6, but it has the same intersection in terms of representation that you would expect. And then the geometry that you see in this code I mentioned three are exactly the new color of the SU5 theory. So, so basically a, a simple geometric structure does reproduce like a growing unified theory to the last detail. Thank you. Last chance, any questions? All right, feel free to come up and uh, talk to Dr. Scully uh, afterwards and uh, let's give him another hand.